man, you said uh, you was like, you know, about things, you know, misconceptions about yourself. Is there anything that you heard where you like, man, I just, I hate that this is what people try to label me as, or this is the 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 perception that people have. You know what I mean? Well, uh, you know, a lot of times, um, us as men, we have to carry ourselves a certain way so nobody would try us. You know, it's almost like a prison mentality. You know, if you don't walk around that certain way, somebody's going to bomb the tissue. My, my thing has been I've never, I never walked a certain way for anybody to know who I am. So it's confusion, you know. Oh, he, he's the gospel dude. He's this, this, and that, you know. But then they meet dudes I grew up with, and they be like, bro, don't touch that dude. That's all I got to tell you, you know. Or they see me speaking, uh, or should I say soft-spoken about an issue, about love, family, and things of that nature. And people may take that as softness. But any time a man is passionate about family, that's the man you really don't want to mess with because that actually means he's a protector. He's willing to die for his. And just people have like a, a dull uh, sense of what real really is. And I grew up different. I grew up seeing men that were actually real and wasn't just talking they were real, they were real. Let me give me an example. I've talked about this before and I teach my sons. Because my old man taught me. When I was a little kid, my daddy would give me like examples. And by the way, I was one of the only dudes who had a daddy at the house. And um, he would say, you see that little dude over there playing? You see that big dude? He, he would ask me, what do they have in common? And I would say, nothing. You know, one big, one little. He'd say, they both men. And when you test a man, a man always had the ability to kill you, son. No matter if he little or big, he's still a man. And I kept that with me, and I grew up seeing it. I had friends in the hood, you know, they look, they look soft, you know what I'm saying? Look like you can push them over, and they were real killers. I'm talking 10, 15, 20 bodies. And... They didn't look like the dude hard with his chest out, what's up, all that. Ain't have one tattoo. Look like you just push them down the street. And they would pull that gun and let it go in a minute. And, and no remorse. I learned that uh, the perception of a person doesn't make him who they are. Hmm. So you can never judge them based on that. And You got to get to know people. Yeah. You got to get to know people. And another thing is, uh, as I got famous and got all the money and was traveling all in Hollywood, New York, I seen how people were treated that were famous with money. And, and I also seen how the famous people treated the regular man. I never liked it. That's why I stopped. Man, I, I didn't go to no parties. I, I almost got to the point where I didn't even want to be around famous people because I would see it so much. My whole career, I've treated everybody the same. The dude that got nothing, full respect. I want to hear what he got to say. I'm, I'm, if I can give him something or teach him something to come up, I'm, I'm, I so passionately want to do that for him. The dude that's up, I show him respect. The same thing. And a lot of times the dudes that's up and got money, they think they can treat people a certain type of way. Or they can look down on somebody. Oh, bro, I can't stand that. So what I did as I got famous, I kept hanging with the people on the bottom. And they used to say, nigga, what you doing? Over there? Man, I'm comfortable over here. Because at least these people are real. Who do you think you are? I, I never liked that, bro. I've always been for the underdog. So that's why you've never heard of, oh, wine, no birthday bash, jefe wine, party. Mm -hmm. Or like celebrities do now, when they give or help somebody, they make they tell the whole world, hey, I'm finna do this. I'm giving away, I'm giving this to this family. I've done it for years, but you'll never hear people about it. I don't want you everybody to know. I just want 
the most high to know. I want God to know. Because I ain't doing it for a pat on the back or to get some type of puff up. I don't care about that. I care about when I go home at night. Nobody's around. I look myself in the mirror. and Do I see a man? Do I see a bitch? Do I see a, a manipulator, a weak dude, an insecure dude? Or do I see somebody that believes in himself, somebody that cares about others, that want to see other people rise up and do something in their life? I got to see a real man when I look in that mirror. And I ain't got nothing to do with somebody pat me on the back, telling me a good job. Hmm. So that uh, that has been a blessing and a curse for my my business, my gifts, because I can to this day I can outwork anybody in the business. You know, I had uh, this was years ago. Maurice Starr, one of the only producers to ever make a billion dollars. By the way, being a producer since you produce, he's a dude who did uh, new uh, new kids on the block. The Backstreet Boys or whatever he, oh, Mar yeah, used to wear. The, yeah, I know you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. old dude. Old dude. What used to wear the uh, the, the 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 sailor or whatever it was. Some type <laughs> yeah, of, yeah, yeah. That's I know that's you're that's talking about. Yeah, yeah, I met him years ago. I was in Hollywood. She was probably somewhere I I couldn't even afford to be. You know, in this restaurant, the plates each plate, the cheapest plate was like two hundred fifty dollars. Like I like, I said y'all definitely paying for this. I ain't paying for this, <laughs> but I met him there. And uh, I had this artist that uh, Master P wanted to sign. It was a, a, a white girl. She was from the country, but she could blow like a black chick out of, out of the choir. Like, she was cold, boy. And uh, he started hanging around me as I did work. I pumped out beats and sent them off. And he's been around a lot of producers. He know the beginning stage all the way. And he said, man, he said, dude, you out work anybody ever met. Me and Daz Dillinger from the Dog Pound, Snoop Dogg's cousin. Uh, I knew his mother, and his mother kept trying to get us together. Kept trying, because see, at the time, I was doing the Christian hip hop. I was just going to ask, how do you meet Daz's mom? You know what I'm saying? That's <laughs> a random meet, dog. <laughs> I know, it's crazy. I was on a TV show in, uh, I was on a TV show in L.A., and I ran into her. His mother is a preacher. People didn't know that, you know, Snoop's auntie. She did pray. She said, I've been praying for them knuckleheads forever. That's why he didn't go to prison. That's why they ain't dead, you know. <laughs> and they'll tell you, yeah, that's why we ain't dead. That's why we with the prison. It's, it's dad's mama, boy. So she was super sweet, but she just, she was adamant. Like, Kevin, right, you going to get with my son? And she, I guess she did the same thing to him. So me and him decided to do an album back in the day. I released it. I probably re-released it. And uh, I showed up at his house with my equipment. And way back before Jokers was recording in their living room or at a hotel, I was doing it. Dad was like, man, what the, you show up with a mic and this and that? I said, now just get to work. In two days, I produced a whole album. And we wrote to it and everything. And he told me out of his own mouth, he said, bro, I just ain't never seen nobody know how to work like this. He said, bro, I I used to produce Tupac, and he yes. cold with this, but Tupac was write and record. You produce, write, and record in the time. He just, I said, yo. I said, bro, I just, when I'm on it, I'm on it, you know? And uh, why did I bring that up? You got to tell me. Why you I talking about dads? Uh, where were you going with that? I don't know. You just started yeah, talking going, about meeting yeah, dads, meeting dads, T-Lady, and we went somewhere else. I don't know. I'll be going down the street, man. And, um, uh, but I, I, uh, I think we're talking about work ethic or something. Just working. Yeah, work yeah. ethic. Yeah. But uh, oh yeah, and Dad's cold, but his work ethic. That's what I'm gonna beast. say. You telling me, and I'm like, for what I know about Dad's, he one of them ones oh, who get in there and bang a mic. Oh, bro, he's he was something, man. I learned, I learned so much. And anytime I get around somebody that got good, a good gift or a great gift or profound gift, I always. It always rub off on me. Like I, I take a little. I'm gonna take a little bit of that. I'm gonna take a little bit of that, you know. And I add it to my arsenal. Okay, but, sidebar on some nerd out producer shit. Which I was using. Uh, rolling eighteen eighty. Mm. ASR ten. Mm. Yeah, that was in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's old school right there. 
Uh, Lauren Hill did a whole album on that 1880. That's when uh, digital hard hard disk recording really just came out around that time. They were saying, man, you need a vocal booth. You can't be slapping no mic right in the middle of the floor, all this sound. But I I had certain settings that I, I set. And I learned it from a dude out of, in Atlanta. Uh, one of the, the first producers that produced Tony Braxton and got uh, Usher started, a dude by the name of Tim Thomas. And uh, he used to love my voice. He said, bro, yo, nobody in the game got a voice like you. And he had this beautiful house, man, in, in the country, man, and it had wooden floors in Atlanta. And he would take that mic and put it right in the middle of that floor. And I'm like, man, my voice going to be hard. He used to say, no, it ain't. And he had these perfect settings, boy. My voice used to just light up on it. So I took that from him <laughs> and got to do it. Donnie Houston. Donnie Houston.